Hello, and welcome back to Animals Matter. My name is Julia Babb, I'm your host today, and I'm here again with Christina Lefevre, the president and heart and soul of Pro Pollinator Project Rogue Valley. Um, Christina is here today to tell us about the impact uh, that pesticides are having on our pollen neighbors. So welcome back, Christina. Thank so you. glad to see you, and uh, thanks for being here again. Thank you, Julia, I'm just really happy to be here. Um, we were here um, whenever that was and taping the other show and we talked more about mm -hmm, nice things then. Um, and so this section is going to be not maybe quite so nice. We're going to have pesticides. Yeah, but yeah. Well, there's been an increasing uh, coverage in the media of mm -hmm. what's being referred to as, oh, I've heard it called insect Armageddon. I've heard it referred to as a population hemorrhage. Oof. Um, coupled with alarming predictions that we only have a certain number of years before human beings are significantly impacted by yeah. pollinator population decline. Um, how did we get to this mm -hmm. critical stage? Well, that's a really good question. Um, and really, it goes back a long ways. Um, it wasn't something that just happened in the last couple of years. Um, if you think about even, you know, hundreds of years ago, how much open space there was in this country. Um, and that's obviously where pollinators and other creatures would have lived. And as we became more and more uh, populated in this part of the country th throughout the world, really, um, these spaces started disappearing. And so we now have a lot more development. We have a lot more houses. We have a lot more concrete. And you know everybody needs a house. And so without these open spaces growing uh, native plants, trees, um, shrubs, um, the pollinators and the other insects are just going to decline. Um, so obviously loss of habitat is a, is a major thing. Huge. Um, and then, you know, the title of the show is Pesticides and Pollinators. And that has another really huge impact on so many things. Um, we have the use of pesticides, that's increased. Um, we have insecticides, we have herbicides for weeds, we have fungicides, um, and all of those are affecting insects. Um, there's been plenty of studies that talk about that. Um, neonicotinoids, you've probably heard me talk about that. Right. Um, they have been proven to affect the DNA of insects. Right. And so as the DNA changes, obviously that's going to impact um, how the insects are able to live. Um, and it's not just um, honeybees. They're known for the colony collapse disorder. Um, and they, I think that's what first got our mm -hmm, attention, though. That, that is yeah. correct. Um, because people manage honeybees, and yeah. so you know they're wanting those honeybees to live. Um, they, their livelihood is based on that. We're able to manage them. They pollinate so many of our agricultural crops. But our native bees are also affected. Um, anytime you use a pesticide, um, it somehow moves somewhere else. Um, drift is a major thing. Wildflowers are affected, um, so our native bees are affected. So pesticides are having a big impact. Um, and then climate change um, is also having an impact because as we slowly increase the um, temperatures, right? Um, did you know, for instance, that um, insects are not able to regulate their body temperature? We can, you know, even dogs can, right? Mm -hmm. um, but insects are not able to. So with that small incremental, very quick, actually, a rate of um, increase in temperatures, then the insects aren't able to adapt. And so they are susceptible at every part of their life cycle, from the egg to the larva to the pupa to the adult. And so you can have insects that actually are not able to um, continue. Make that yeah. yeah, and so generationally. And then their habitat, I was reading in a Xerxes um, publication about a certain kind of fly, or maybe it was a butterfly, that um, only can live in the um, part of the um, area underneath a melting glacier. And so we have plenty of melting glaciers right now. <laughs> 
Um, but what happens when all those melting glaciers are gone, which is exactly what's happening. So um, even in different parts of the world, we have so many insects that are disappearing. Um, here in Oregon, um, we've had two bumblebee species. One of them I'm sh pretty sure is extinct and the other one might be um, the Franklin's bumblebee um, and then also the Western bumblebee. Both so of the them Franklin's is already gone. I'm pretty sure pretty, the Franklin's much, is gone. For sure. It hasn't been seen since I think 2006. Okay. Uh, and then the Western hasn't been seen so for quite a while. So, you know, what are the ramifications of that? Um, it, it's pretty big um, and this is why this is you know kind of a depressing show um, and it's not just you know hearsay on maybe this report or maybe that report um, back in I guess January of this year there was a, um, a comp compiled report some scientists looked at 73 reports from around the world regarding pollinator decline. Mm -hmm. And they came up with, in order, the loss of habitat, which we just talked about, and then pesticides, and then climate change, and then invasive species, non-native species also is impacting um, the pollinators. And their bottom line, their conclusion was that in the last 10 years, we have lost, oh, 40 percent of insects. Jeez and then we're on track to lose 41% in the next 10 years. Yeah. So if you can do that math, we are looking between you and I, you know, within 10 years in our lifespan, we could have 80% of our insects in the world disappear. So that is pretty disheartening. Um, and then of course, bees and butterflies um, near and dear to our hearts um, are one of them, some of the most susceptible species. And then dung beetles, which is, you know, maybe we don't really think about dung beetles, but um, <laughs> dung Not beetles usually. are, <laughs> <laughs> but dung beetles are very important. And do you know why they're so important? Well, they're, they're cleanup people. They are. They're cleanup species. So we could be knee deep in you know what, right? Or maybe hot thigh deep in you know what, poop and leaves and all sorts of, you know, dead, dead insects. Yeah. And yeah, so they clean those up. So without our dung beetles, we could be in a, world of hurt, to put it mildly. <laughs> Very good, because I know that uh, New York Times, mm -hmm. um, just what was it, February, mm -hmm. that they published uh, yep. um, an article in the New York Times Magazine called Insect Apocalypse. Yep. Talking about um, that. And um, I wondered if you could elaborate on some of the uh, consequences yeah. when pollen neighbors mm -hmm. suffer a population decline this massive. Yeah, well, yeah, um, basically pollination is going to grind to a halt. If we have 80% less insects, um, not all of those are pollinators, of course, but bees and butterflies, pollination is just going to like stop um, unless we hire a lot of people that are going to do the, that job to yeah, pollinate. Yeah, there's a, a picture, I think, yes. uh, of the people in China climbing ladders mm -hmm. to pollinate their, their, their apple trees or something. Yeah, their cherry trees. Yeah. And, yeah, because China is a good example. Mm -hmm. um, a number of decades ago, they had a pretty horrendous pesticide policy, if you will, in some parts of their country, and they actually did have an insect apocalypse. Yeah. I think things are coming back, um, but yeah, they've hired people and continue to hire people to self to, to people pollinate the um, the blossoms, and so we'll have to be doing that. Either that, or maybe we just find that our fruits and vegetables, what we are accustomed to eating, are farther and fewer between. Right. Um, Become delicacies yeah. and rarities, but yes, um, you know, I, I think, um, you know, what, what did, what's the, the figure that I saw that one out of every three bites yes. of food is, um, th you know, brought because, to you by. Mm -hmm, because of pollinators. Yeah. That's right. Um, so, you know, we think of, well, I think of my favorite foods, blueberries and strawberries and, you know, cherries and squash. Um, even broccoli is a pollinated crop oh, um, because that. of the seed. You yep. have to have broccoli seed, well, carrot seed. Very tiny flowers. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and so without our pollinators, then we're going to end up eating things that aren't pollinated like wheat and um, rice and corn, but even <laughs> corn does better pollinated. So, and then there are some self-pollinating fruits, so granted, but they do, even they do better when they're pollinated, yeah. when there's a pollinator around. So we have to think about our food supply, our food supply, but then, you know, insects are eaten by other insects, by 
um, birds, and we're already seeing a decrease of birds. And there have been studies that they're pretty sure the birds are starving in places because there aren't not enough insects. Um, bats eat insects, um, other wildlife, frogs. frogs um, oh yeah, there's a huge decline already in, in some parts of the world. So, you know, what is going to happen? We have to think about that. Um, I really don't necessarily feel optimistic that we're going to be getting ourselves out of this um, situation as a species, as a human species. I really can be, uh, I can become depressed about it. But I do feel optimistic about the people here in the Rogue Valley. Yep. Um, I do think that, you know, we live in a special place and people want to protect all what we have here. And people are planting pollinator gardens and looking at the amount of pesticides that are used. Um, so, you know, I, I, I feel optimistic about where we are, but maybe not the big picture. Mm -hmm. So. And I'm wondering, um, I know that you just got back from mm. a trip up to Salem last week yeah. um, and to uh, address the legislature or the, what it was, the House of Representatives, mm -hmm. um, because there's a bill. Um, mm -hmm. I don't remember what bill it is, but um, I, I'm, I'm just wondering, is there the political will to really push this through? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I'm not sure. Um, you would hope so by now that, you know, they're reading these headlines and, you know, thinking about it. But there are interests that want to continue to use pesticides. Um, I think that people are beginning to realize that we do need to limit our, pe our the pesticide use and making the bill was, um, the, the purpose of the bill is to make neonicotinoids a restricted use pesticide, which means that um, homeowners are not able to go to the store, for instance, and just pick up a bottle of something that says aphid killer or, you know, in, in fungicide killer or whatever. Um, it's confusing because neonicotinoid, the word neonicotinoid is actually not on the bottle. Yeah, it never shows up. Mm -mm. There are seven neonicotinoids. Um, wow. There's five of them maybe that the home owner, the home gardener would see. Um, the most common one is imidacloprid, which is a really hard word to say, imidacloprid. And um, that's the one that um, is really doing a lot of damage to the ecosystem. It um, not only is affecting insects through the pollen and the nectar, since the plant um, takes it up through all cells in the plant and the pollen and the nectar become toxic. And so the um, insect takes it back to their hive or their nest. Um, and then it also is getting into the water, so it affects insects that live in the water, like caddisflies and mayflies. Um, so if we can at least make those restricted um, use pesticides, that would be a big thing. Will our legislators do that? I don't know. Um, but we did do a great attempt. There were a lot of people there. We had experts um, talking about this, these issues. And I really would like to say, Thank you very much to the people of Southern Oregon. We ask people to respond to this, um, send in letters, and we got a lot of letters. Um, I see a lot of names on the list of people that I know their names, I know who they are, and I really want to say thank you Great. for that. Great, very good. Um, I'm just wondering um, at this point, um, well, no, I want to back up for just a second because I want to say um, maybe that the efforts that we're making in Oregon and Rogue Valley in specific um, can kind of be a petri dish, uh, a test, mm -hmm. you yeah. know, sort of a place to figure out what works and, and uh, you know, maybe mm -hmm. we can be a model community for yeah. other other communities uh, around great. the country, maybe around the world. I know Germany's doing a lot of stuff about, um, I mean, I, I think, uh, some German citizen scientists mm -hmm. were actually part of that yes. story from the New York Times. Well, yes. That's a super interesting article, by the way, and I, knew, I know that that's on your website. Yes. So people can definitely go there and check it out. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, you know, it's not just the Rogue Valley. There's a lot of other places in the country that are responding, but mm -hmm. I don't think it's enough yet. Um, I don't, the, the people, you know, it's, and I'm afraid, like I said, that it's almost, maybe it's too late. Um, in the scheme of things, if we're already 40% down and we're on track to be another 40% down. Um, so we have a lot of work to do um, to help our pollinators by creating landscape, creating gardens, and not using pesticides and thinking about, you know, really it's like thinking about a bee, be a bee, be a butterfly, think about where would you like to live and um, what their natural habitat is. 
Um, you know, just something as simple as leaving your leaves in certain parts of your yard is important because who knew butterfly chrysalises, some of the butterfly chrysalises overwinter under the leaves yeah. Yeah. or on dead plants. So, you know, leaving your garden kind of messy yeah. is actually a very good thing for yeah, a pollinator. Yeah, that's a perfect segue for the next question oh, I'm going to ask okay. you is how can regular old people like me um, in your garden um, Neatness, I guess, isn't such a great idea. No, I mean, you don't, you don't <laughs> want your neighbors to come knocking on your door. But on the other hand, um, you know, thinking about, like I said, what a pollinator needs. And it's an ecosystem that um, we really need to grow. Um, I, I, th I feel that, there's a, that we have a moral responsibility, actually, because since we as a human species are taking out the um, habitat for our pollinators that we need to put back. And if we have a yard um, or any kind of landscape, at least putting some of it for the pollinators is, is really important. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, leaving your leaves in the, in the fall, in the winter, not cutting the seed heads um, in, is important. Talking to your neighbors, obviously stop using pesticides is, is crucial. Oh, yeah. um, and then, you know, think about helping other people be educated. Mm -hmm. um, get on the buzzway is another important thing. Yeah, and it, it is a, an important distinction to make because we are, there are definitely things we ought to start mm -hmm. doing, but there's definitely things we ought to stop immediately. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah, so um, that's, that's definitely good to know. And I think you've, again, got guidelines on the yeah. website. Yes, um, I'm glad you said the website because we do have um, on there information about the neonicotinoids. Um, we have some great resources for, um, about planting um, pollinator gardens. Um, a lot of the plants that are here for the Southern Oregon, we have that on there. Um, so check out our website, let us know. Um, sign up for our pollinator newsletter, pollinator times newsletter. Um, that would be great. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, and definitely check out that because that is an extensive mm -hmm. uh, website. Mm -hmm. um, so, and uh, what is it? You were going to tell us to enjoy our gardens. Oh yes, uh, and then so, get out and enjoy your garden. Yes. Thank you. I knew there was there something else because you know. You're, you're, you got to introduce yourself to your pollen neighbors. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So I don't have enough time in my garden, but I hope everybody else has time in theirs. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And this, it's a beautiful day today. Yes. Um, that's all great advice. And uh, I was just wondering, I would give you some time to, to bring up any other issues that you think are important at this point. Yeah. Um, any other bits of trivia? Like I'm, one of my favorite bits of trivia about this whole thing is that while our pollinators are going into decline, things like cockroaches oh, and yeah. mouse flies, for some reason, are on the upswing. Yeah. So. Yeah, as the temperature changes, it's actually better for cockroaches and mosquitoes. Oh. You know, it's getting a little bit warmer, and so um, they're doing all right. Um, so that's why, you know, plant a tree. It's getting to be Arbor Day soon oh, in yeah. the month of April. So um, plant a native tree that has blossoms. If you think about a tree, it's like a huge amount of blossoms that can support our pollinators and then the birds. Um, you know, we've talked about native plants before, maybe not so much on this show, um, but there's a man named Doug Tallamy, Dr. Doug Tallamy, um, and he's in on the East Coast. And um, one of the things he talks about is the importance of the native um, plants, and he gives us example of a tree. So he compares a ginkgo tree to a native oak tree, and this is back east, but it's still comparable to here. And he had gone out and done a study to see how many species would be supported of, at the ginkgo versus the um, Interesting. oak. And it was one species versus 532 species. Wow. Isn't that amazing? That is amazing. So if we think about how, you know, what species, what quantities of species do we want, an oak tree is a, probably a pretty good thing. And mm -hmm. there's others. Um, just having a garden that um, can support that and um, making sure that our soil is in good shape to, to grow healthy plants, to, gr to support healthy pollinators. Yeah, you know, and another thing I think, uh, where was it? I read some letter to the editor in some publication here in Ashland that um, somebody was saying, why are you picking on non-natives? Mm. And like, we're just being, uh, uh, like it's just an arbitrary thing. Mm. But I would like for you to like explain why it's so important to have native 
plants mm -hmm. for these native pollinators? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so native plants um, like oh, um, Louisia is a beautiful native plant to have in your garden. Um, and then um, some of the others, which of course I'm drawing a blank on at this exact moment, madrones and manzanitas, um, and then our native pollinators, our bees and our butterflies, they've co-evolved over 120 million years, if you can believe that. Yeah. Um, and so the nutrit nutritive value of these plants and the way the blossoms are shaped um, are going to be benefiting our native pollinators. Um, and so the honeybee is, is not a native um, bee, but we need them, of course, for so many of our agricultural crops, which of course are not native. But having our, th you know, thinking more about our native um, species is so important to make sure that they are going to be surviving. Um, there's 199,000 insect species in the world that are pollinators. And those are obviously native yeah. to where they live. Yeah. Um, and so there's much more to life than just our, our good old fashioned honeybee. Yeah, or the, or the butterfly. I know mm -hmm. that uh, I, I, did, I did hear um, Travis Owen talking mm -hmm. about like so many of the pollinators are so tiny. They are. That we don't even know that they exist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they or, are. Or you're, you know, people like me who don't like notice everything and I'm not an entomologist either. Right. Um, so yeah, th there is an amazing amount mm -hmm. of work being done without us even knowing, knowing about them. it. Yeah, yeah. so we, we, we had um, a, shared a bar of chocolate right before this show, right? Mm -hmm. And it's, so do you know how cho cocoa beans are pollinated? Yes, I do, thanks to you. <laughs> That's right. We have a little <laughs> tiny midge. The chocolate pollinating midge. Exactly. So, you know, there's a lot of things that are because, and if we have pesticides, that are being used on these crops, then it's actually going to be decimating our pollinators in the long run. Um, we were talking about the monarchs. One of the reasons, major reasons, that they are in such decline, 99% decline over the past um, 10 years mm -hmm. or so, is because of the amount of glyphosate or Roundup right. that's used um, on the fields to grow um, the various GMO crops, actually, right. uh, like corn and soybeans. And so the milkweed is being t taken away, right. being decimated, which in the turn decimates the monarchs because they don't have anything to eat as a caterpillar. Right. And, uh, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, Rachel Carson wrote mm. Silent Spring in 1962, and I bet she's spinning in her grave right yeah. now. I mean, we get rid of DDT, and, mm -hmm. but there's still all these other things that are being you know, said, oh, it, it's a weed killer. Don't That's worry. Right. You know, right. it just kills weeds. Right. It's okay. Right. And we have really no idea of the impact that we're having when we go out. And you saw the picture of the tract houses. If everybody in those tract houses yes. went and bought a bottle of whatever and neonicotinoids and was spraying it all over the place, um, right. the impact is huge. It's a very big, um, yeah. it is. And everybody thinks it's okay because it's just the neighborhood hardware store that's selling why would they sell right. me something bad that's a very good point right. and you know the herbicide like roundup which is glyphosate the main ingredient of glyphosate there was actually a study recently that um, they showed that the gut of honeybees you know the inside the gut lining is perturbed that's a scientific word which basically means there's holes oh. um, the so the roundup makes holes in the gut lining of the honeybees and I think most of us know that your gut is like a pretty important part of your body and um, even in a honeybee. And so right. what that does um, for the life of the honeybee, it's going to either shorten her lifespan um, or she's not going to be able to do the job. She gets disoriented. She can't go back to her hive um, and the hive is going to decline. So, you know, it's just an herbicide, but they've proved that it actually does affect the honeybees. Um, and then the drift from using any of these pesticides um, Think about what's happening in orchards, and you see the big blast sprayers, and it's carrying no telling what that is. Hmm. Probably neonicotinoids, um, fungicides, which um, actually Xerxes has come out with a paper that says the fungicides, um, especially combined with other insecticides, is actually probably the most toxic oh, to wow. insects. So Well, and they all fall under that general umbrella of pesticides. Right. Correct. And, uh, you know, it's just what we, we, what we have decided to define as a pest. Yeah, well, um, that's right. And a lot of that is just a kind of not understanding what, what role this insect that is or correct. plant 
plays in our ecosystem. Yeah, and so, so back to your question of, you know, what can people do? One of the things, in addition to planting a garden and getting on the buzzway, is, you know, just learn who all the different pollinators are and what they look like in different life cycles. Yeah. Um, I have a story to tell you, a little short story. Mm -hmm. um, so a long time ago, um, a long time ago, mm -hmm. um, I saw a little black and red little insect that was fairly scary looking, and I assumed it was bad, so I killed it and really knew what it was. Christina. I know. It was a ladybug <laughs> larva. Oh, yeah, yeah. I've seen those. They don't look all cute and roly-poly no. like a ladybug. Nope. So yeah. I've learned now. Yeah. So those are really great to have in they your garden. They are great, and they're cool looking. That's right. Yeah. So anything else you want to communicate to people? Oh, I wanted to, to also, another bit of trivia yes. is like the, the, the amounts of, um, well, I guess, neonicotinoids mm -hmm. that, are, that were in the... the uh, House of Representatives in oh. Washington, D.C. is their cafeteria? Yeah, that was back in 2015. There was a study um, done, and um, they tested, I think, 66 foods, uh, like peppers and squash and tomatoes and bell peppers. And of those foods, 91% actually tested positive for neonicotinoids. There was a study just done recently, um, Beyond Toxics participated in a study, Friends of the Earth was also part of it. And um, of those um, foods that were tested, um, I forget now the percentage, but oh, 80%, that's what it was, 80% um, uh, uh, actually tested positive for neonicotinoids, like spinach and apples were, yeah, were, were up basic there. basic stuff. Yeah. These were non-organic foods. These were conventional foods. Mm -hmm. So it just goes to show you how pervasive these neonicotinoids are. And then there's others. And, you know, it's not just for our food. It's also thinking about the health of the farm workers. Mm -hmm. um, they're the ones that are working in the fields and they're being exposed to these. Uh -huh. um, I gotta, I gotta cut you off. I, I think it's terrible. I, I know that we have like a lot more to talk about, but that's unfortunately all the time we have okay. for today. And um, I just want to thank you so much you're for being welcome. here and for doing the work that you're doing to raise awareness and to help us understand these critical issues because it is coming. Yes. This is not just some scary story. No, this it's is not. reality. Yeah. I, I, but I do appreciate that there are things we can stop doing and things yes. we can start doing. So thank you so much for you're being very here, welcome. Christina. Thank you, Julia. All right. Uh, we'd like to thank SOU for their support of RBTV, Rogue Valley Community Television, and a special big wet sloppy kiss to Wanda Borland, our producer, and her all-volunteer crew for making it possible for us to tape this show today. Um, thank you for joining us on Animals Matter. I am Julia Babb, your host. See you next time. <laughs>